That was an Aztec death whistle. Made by the same civilization that ripped out human hearts atop massive temples to appease their gods. Welcome to the chilling world of the Aztecs. The Aztecs' practice of human sacrifice was deeply embedded into their complex belief system. It was a ritual as regular as it was grand, an offering of life to appease the gods and ensure the continuation of the world. The victims, often captured warriors, were led up the temple steps to meet their fate and the gods. The belief was strong, the gods were nourished by the life force within the human heart. Each sacrifice was a covenant, a promise of another day, another sunrise. Thousands could be sacrificed over short periods during specific events, underscoring the scale and societal importance of this ritual. It was a brutal yet intrinsic aspect of Aztec culture, believed to maintain the delicate balance of the cosmos. The grandeur of Aztec temples, like the iconic Templo Mayor, was a reflection of the civilization's spiritual and architectural sophistication. Each structure, adorned with intricate carvings and murals, was a narrative of myths, an homage to the gods and a display of astronomical knowledge. The dual shrines of Tempo Mea epitomize the Aztecs' belief in the balance of forces, a theme recurrent in their cosmology. These temples weren't just religious epicenters, but also hubs of learning. Priests and scholars delved into the mysteries of the stars, crafted calendars, and documented the empire's expansive history here. Every stone, every corner was imbued with meaning, making these temples not just architectural marvels, but also sacred grounds where the mortal met the divine, and where the pulse of the Aztec civilization was profoundly felt. The Aztecs, with their intricate rituals and ceremonies, had a particular chilling practice, the flaying of captives. This wasn't some arbitrary act of violence, it was steeped in symbolism and religious significance. Flaying, the act of removing skin, was seen as a form of rebirth. It was a transformation, albeit a dark one, that resonated deeply within their beliefs. The festival of Tlaclachipleulitzli was when this act became the focal point. Captives, often warriors from defeated tribes, were chosen for this ritual. It was believed that by offering these individuals, they were appeasing Shipe Totek, the god of spring and regeneration. The act of wearing the flayed skins was not just for shock value. Priests believed that by donning these skins, they were drawing closer to the god, channeling his essence and ensuring prosperity for the land. But there was also a strategic angle to this. The psychological impact on enemies and potential rivals was undeniable. Witnessing such a ritual was a clear indicator of the lengths the Aztecs would go to, both in their devotion to the gods and in asserting their dominance. Beyond the rituals of flaying, the Aztecs had another grim display of power and devotion. The Tzompantli, or Skull Racks. These structures, massive in scale, were adorned with the skulls of those sacrificed. Some of these racks are believed to have held tens of thousands of skulls. These weren't just displays of brutality, they were symbols. They showcased the Aztecs' military victories and their unwavering religious commitment. If for allies, it was a sign of the protection and strength the Empire provided. For adversaries, it was a stark, unmissable warning. But there was also a spiritual dimension to these racks. The displayed skulls, once belonging to individuals offered to the gods, now served a perpetual purpose. They were seen as ongoing tributes, souls that continued to aid the Aztecs in their cosmic battles, ensuring the world's balance. The Aztecs weren't content with just ruling the bustling city of Tenochtitlan. They had their eyes set on the horizon, and they were hungry for more. Their ambition was like a fire, and the vast Mesoamerican landscape was the fuel. Their strategy for expansion wasn't just about brute force, though they had plenty of that. It was a blend of diplomacy, strategic alliances, and, when necessary, military conquests. They would often form alliances with smaller city-states, offering protection in exchange for loyalty, 
And for those who didn't willingly join the Aztec fold, well, that's where their formidable military came into play. Once a city was conquered, the Aztecs were smart about integration. They didn't just bulldoze the local culture, they assimilated aspects of it, weaving it into the broader tapestry of the Aztec civilization. This not only enriched their own culture, but also made the conquered feel a part of this grand empire. However, expansion wasn't always a walk in the park. The Aztecs faced resistance, both from cities they sought to conquer and from within their own ranks. Revolts were not uncommon, but the Aztecs, with their blend of military strategy, psychological warfare, and sheer determination, managed to quell most uprisings. Remember the Aztecs' death whistle? It emitted a bone-chilling, otherworldly sound across the battlefield, striking terror into the bravest warrior's heart. This eerie instrument wasn't just for show, it was a psychological weapon, horrifying foes with its wail. Also consider the Macuhutl, a brutal marvel of Aztec engineering. It combined the sharpness of obsidian blades with the heft of a club. These fearsome blades could slice through flesh and bone with ease, making it a deadly instrument in the hands of a skilled warrior. For long-range combat, the Aztecs had the Atlatl, a tool that increased the range and accuracy of ordinary spears. It allowed Aztec warriors to strike down enemies from a distance, demonstrating their ingenuity. The Aztec military also had a well-defined rank system that mirrored their society's values. Ranks were based on bravery, strategy, and the ability to capture enemies alive. Taking prisoners was a path to glory in Aztec society, emphasizing capture over killing. In essence, the Aztecs were empire builders and innovators in the art of psychology and war. From the spine-chilling death whistle to the deadly Macuhutl and the ingenious Adlatl, their tools and tactics kept enemies perpetually wary. But here's where the plot thickens. The Aztecs, for all their might, had a chink in their armor, a long list of not-so-friendly neighbors. And when the Spanish, led by Hernán Cortés, landed on their shores, they didn't just see an empire, they saw an opportunity. The Spanish, ever the opportunists, didn't waste time. They formed alliances with native groups who weren't exactly Team Aztec. Tlaxcalans, anyone? With these newfound allies, the Spanish had the local intel and manpower to challenge the Aztecs. But let's not paint the Aztecs as mere victims here. They were a force to be reckoned with, and they didn't go down without a fight. However, a combination of superior weaponry, strategic alliances, and, let's face it, diseases the Europeans brought with them led to the eventual downfall of the once mighty empire. It's a classic tale of rise and fall, with a sprinkle of old world meets new world drama. We've covered their conquests, their religious practices, and penchant for applied psychology. But the Aztecs had more tricks up their sleeves than a magician at a kid's birthday party. Ever heard of floating gardens? No, it's not some mythical land from a fairy tale. It's Chinampas, the ingenious Aztec solution to the farming challenge. You see, they faced quite the conundrum with Lake Texcoco. Farming on it was like trying to balance on a waterbed. Not the most stable ground, I can assure you. But did the Aztecs give up and move inland? No, they instead decided to flex on all of South America with their feet of engineers. Except the Incas, maybe. And so, the remarkable floating gardens came to life. These weren't just for aesthetics, they were remarkably productive and sustainable. Think about growing crops like maize, beans, and squash right on the water. It was a bit like farming's version of thinking outside the box. But why go to all this trouble, you ask? Well, it wasn't just about having a pretty view while tending their crops. These gardens played a vital role in feeding the empire's colossal urban populations. They were like the fast food joints of the Aztec world, but with fresher ingredients. But there's more to the Aztec empire than conquering and water-based agriculture. It had a social hierarchy that could give any modern-day high school clique a run for its money. A society where everyone had their place 
and I mean everyone. The Aztecs had a rigid class system that made today's social hierarchy look like a breeze. At the summit were the rulers, priests and nobles, reveling in privilege and power. Below them, you had the commoners, toiling the land, crafting goods, and keeping the empire ticking. And then came the slaves, people with the toughest gig in town, doing the grunt work so others could live the high life. But this is not the extent of social norms in place. There were rules governing how these classes interacted. Nobles had to maintain their noble facade. Commoners had to know their station, and slaves, well, they didn't have much say in the matter. Can you fathom living in a society where your birth determined your destiny? One misstep, and you'd find yourself in hot water. It was like tiptoeing through a minefield, but with much higher stakes. But then, perhaps taking the edge off of a day's brutal tribulations, was cacao. The Aztecs were pioneers in the world of cocoa. Well ahead of its time as a fancy latte flavor, cacao wasn't just a beverage, it was a cultural phenomenon. They used it as a form of currency and trade, making it as valuable as gold. Just imagine buying your groceries with chocolate bars today. Delicious, right? But it didn't stop there. Cacao played a pivotal role in their rituals and ceremonies. It was akin to their version of a good luck charm, something they couldn't do without. The Aztecs emerged as a civilization that danced to the beat of their own drum, being one of the most horrific civilizations to exist, but undeniably one of the most unique.